still surrender Thank you. 
to be rest for souls. We receive the new thing you have for us today. We believe that you will finish the work you've begun in us. So whatever it is that's holding us back, we open our hands and we release it to you. We yield. We yield to your will. We love you, Jesus. Is it in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We'll show some verses on the screen. We're in Mark chapter 2 today, going into Mark chapter 3 as well. Um, and then we'll stop in the first Samuel uh, 21 as well. But Mark 2 and 3 is primarily where we'll be. Hey, if you were with us last week, we, uh, we made an announcement. And this past Friday, I want to thank all of our men for showing up well. At our, yeah, at our men's conference, we had a men's event on our Fort Lauderdale campus on Friday. You can see some of the photos there. The topic was around being resilient. And uh, what an awesome time in the Word. We had some guest speakers as well. Uh, just talking about how men can really rise up. And despite what we've been through, 2020 and beyond, uh, how do we continue to be resilient, to, to be flexible, yet strong? You know, strong in that we're not easily moved, but flexible enough to be able to pivot when needed. And um, speaking of strength, I don't know if he's here today, but they had a, like a fitness competition in the beginning, like a push-up contest. And it just so happened that two of our, like, Massive bodybuilder guys were there, so I was like, you're representing Parkland, get up there, and they did like 90 push-ups in a minute. So we came in second place, but we had the best form. So, anyway, the strength of Parkland is strong. Um, so we always look forward to those events, for men, for women, it's an awesome thing to be able to do and gather together to hear what God has to speak to us. Uh, speaking of which, we think about community and connecting people to others. Wednesday nights, I want to just remind everybody, we have classes going on right now. We have our, our group, actually, our Parkland group, on Zoom as well. So Wednesday nights at 6.30, if you go to calvaryftl.org slash groups, 
If you're not a part of a group now, we'd love to have you join a group so that during the week you have a place to connect and hear more about God's word and what he's speaking to us, but also find this family of fellowship, even through virtual or Zoom. We've heard some really cool stories about salvations and baptisms and beyond, um, even through Zoom, even through online platforms. So we want to make sure you're involved with community. And then as far as connecting people to ways to serve outreach, uh, here at our campus, I want to make an announcement that next week we are actually launching our toddler ministry, if you would. What does that mean? Well, yeah, that is definitely what we want to plug. For those moms and dads who are chasing their toddlers um, throughout our service, um, those days can potentially be over. Starting next week, we're going to be opening up our space for our one and two year olds. Um, and so if you want to pop by on your way out of here, you take a left straight through. We have the room open so you can peek in. Um, obviously, there's no kids in there yet. But just to get an idea of what your kids will be um, experiencing or whatnot. We're excited about that. At the same time, we do pray for God to call more people if you feel like you have the call to serve. Whether it's with our kids, because obviously we continue to need more leaders, even though we're starting this next week. Um, but in also other places, like our hospitality, even whether it's greeting or ushering or you know, we have some upgraded camera equipment uh, and for our online community as well. Um, we're excited to see what God will continue to do um, as he calls people to serve him and his people. So we're excited about what's going to be happening there. So pray about a way to serve. Pray about a way to be involved. And, uh, and God will do the rest. Amen? Amen? All right. So Mark chapter 2, chapter 3. We're going to be in today. We're going to continue to answer this question of who is Jesus. Be joined with me in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you today, and we are thankful, and we're humbled that we have an opportunity to come together to hear a word from you. We know that in many places, it's not even legal to do that, and as much as the world tries to shut down your word, and places to access it, and places to come together, we know that you've opened up an opportunity here in our city for such a time as this. And so we pray today you can help us put away distractions, help us to be reminded of who you are, right, on an even deeper level today as we dive into your word. And learn more about who you are. We thank you for the work that you're doing. We pray for those who have needs. Whether it's healing in this time of uh, pandemic. Uh, whether it's something going on in a marriage. Uh, we want to continue to pray just for blessings over the homes of all those who are here. And as we hear from you. Help us to be more like you. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright so who here grew up loving like old cartoons? I don't mean like the new Pokemon stuff. I mean like the old like Looney Tunes, like the Bugs Bunny, maybe the Disney stuff. So if you guys remember the old Roadrunner cartoons, so Wile E. Coyote, for a younger group, we may have to explain some of this. But there was Wile E. Coyote, and he would always try to trap and chase uh, this Roadrunner. And, and, and you probably hear the beep beeps in your heads as you're thinking about this, but those of you who know... But they would, he would try to trap them, he would try to go after this roadrunner, and would almost always fail. I think there was maybe one or two times that he succeeded. Um, but ultimately, every cartoon you can watch, there's always something funny that happened, there'd be a trap that was set up, and then of course, Wally e. Coyote would fail, and the roadrunner would be victorious. And some of you are asking, what does that have to do with Mark chapter 2? Well, did you know that there were actually people in the days of Jesus, when he walked the earth, being fully God and fully man, if you were with us last week, Pastor Bill Schott, he was here, and he taught us about just even more so how Jesus is forgiving sins, proving that he is God. And so Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 2, we're just halfway through the chapter, and there is proof that Jesus is God through his healing, through his forgiving. But there were some, these Pharisees, these men of the law, that would like to play the role of Wile E. Coyote in setting traps for Jesus. And it's amazing to think that, well, if you knew that somebody was fully God and fully man, of course, at that time, sure there were many who doubted. Scripture tells us that. But they would actually try to set up these traps for Jesus. And so these next couple chapters are going to just show us a little bit of the examples of the traps. And the reason why I think about these cartoons is because it's always so funny how, you know, the coyote always thought he was smarter than the roadrunner or faster than the roadrunner. And, and in some sense, these Pharisees, they think they're going to trap the one who is fully God and fully man. And so you see how they're set up, yet always fail, because we serve a God who, well, he can't be trapped. And so if you look through, you, you think about it in our life, well, yeah, we know that God can't be trapped, although there were traps set up. But what about in your life? Have you ever been in a situation where you felt trapped? Maybe a situation where you thought there was, hey, no way to get out of this, or the only way to get out was an extremely difficult task. Something that came very popular over the last couple of years are these escape rooms. Anybody ever been through one of these escape rooms? I don't know how popular they are in COVID. 
But a couple years back, these escape rooms became very popular. And if you've been through them before, usually you and a group of others are set up in this room. And you, and you have this mission to get out of the room, but there's all these puzzles that you have to solve to get there. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a huge fan of these type of puzzles. In fact, they frustrate me in some ways. And I've only been through two escape rooms, and I'm still here, so obviously I escaped. But uh, one of them, I remember, it was like a, set up like a jail cell. And you're in there with a bunch of other people. And they're great team building activities. In fact, we did it with some of our team as well. And we're in this jail cell, I'm looking out, and they had set the keys up just so you can see them. But you can't get to them unless you solve like 10 puzzles to get to them. Uh, and I'll be honest, I relied a lot on the, the strength of the people that were around me to solve some of these. But I remember the situation, and now you know you're paying for this and you're going to get out. Because it's just an entertainment thing. But there are situations in our life where we felt like we're put in this proverbial jail cell or prison or room. And we're looking around, we almost see the exit, we almost see the keys, how am I going to get out of the situation? Maybe it's a relationship you're in. Maybe it's a job that you've been put in. Maybe it's just a, a health situation that you just don't know how am I going to get out of this situation. The, the doctors aren't saying it's very favorable. But there's got to be a way out, yet I feel trapped. These escape rooms remind us of that. But what about emotionally trapped? If you're in this situation where you feel like you're in a relationship where you feel like you're trapped, maybe you're looking for a job and you haven't quite got there, you haven't put the pieces of this puzzle together to then open up the door, to then release the key. Because our life, much like an escape room, is full of decisions and puzzles and sometimes traps that may put us in situations where the only way that I can get out of this is something supernatural. And, and I was mentioning before in Mark chapter 2, we see the situations that Jesus was put in, that when you look at it and us reading years later, only God can do those things. We saw how he was teaching in the synagogue. He was teaching these words of God with authority that only God can do. We saw him healing a man. Healing. Only God can do that. Yeah, he may use doctors, but only God can actually heal. And just this last chapter, we saw how he came and, yes, healed a man when he told him to pick up your mat and walk, but he also forgave sins. Yeah, he was one who claimed that he forgave sins. And we were reminded last week that if only God can do these things, then when someone ever asked the question, well, did Jesus ever say he's God? Well, clearly he has, and not just verbally, but in the way that he lived, the actions that he did. And so today, we're going to see a little bit more about these wily coyotes that try to trap him. We're going to see how Jesus continues to prove that he, in fact, is God. And he's also a God who asks many questions. Now, why would God, who is all-knowing, and everywhere at all times, why would he need to ask questions? And it began in the book of Genesis when he actually asked Adam a question of, hey, where are you? And it's not because he didn't know where he was. And he doesn't ask questions because he needs to know the answers, the information. But he asked these questions to reveal the heart. Yeah, there was about 183 questions that was asked of Jesus. To those, he answered roughly three directly. But he always asked or answered questions with a question. That's simply how it went. He asked about 307 questions or so and during his ministry. He's the God of questions. He wants to reveal the heart. And he can easily just give you an answer to all the questions. But the questions that he asked when these people try to trap him, well, it's going to reveal the heart. And we're going to see that in Mark chapter 2 today where Jesus is kind of saying, hey, catch me if you can. Like there's going to be some traps that you're going to try to throw my way, but... Come on, keep, keep coming at me and see if you can actually catch me in this, knowing that he is a God who can't be trapped. And so Mark chapter 2, verse 18, is where we will start. It says, The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Here's a question. Verse 19, And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? He answers with another question. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. And so if you're taking notes, 
Jesus is going to be freeing us of these traps. And the first trap that we see that's trying to put in front of them, that he actually frees us from, is Jesus frees us from the trap of our past. Of our past. Well, he's speaking of new wine. He's speaking of these clothes that are now torn, and we're trying to put this new patch in these old clothes, or new wine into old wineskins. And the question that he's asking as he responds, you see already the first question that's asked about fasting. And he responds with the question, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? And some of you may be asking, well, that is a good question. I don't know what that actually may look like, but if you've been to a wedding before, maybe it was your own or someone else's, I, I have the, the pleasure and the joy of officiating a wedding in a couple weeks and looking forward to that. But I imagine on that day when, this, when you say, hey, I do, and it's man and it's wife, and join together as one, and all of a sudden we're going to have this joyous occasion. I imagine the groom is not going to stand up and say, Thank you, everyone, for coming for our wedding. We are going to be fasting for the rest of the afternoon. So have a seat, and we're going to sit and just talk, and no one's going to eat, and no one's going to drink, and nothing like that. No, typically at weddings, it's a time to celebrate. You're there with the bride and the groom, and you're celebrating. You have, you know, all sorts of food and drinks and all this happening because it's a time to celebrate. And Jesus is reminding us, he's not saying that there's something wrong with fasting. In fact, just a month or so ago, we went through these uh, habits of grace. We talked about fasting being one of them. And so there's a time for fasting for sure. In fact, in just three weeks before Easter, we're all, yes, all of you, going to come together and celebrate this 21 days of fasting. If you've never fasted before, uh, it doesn't mean you eat nothing for that time period. There's many different ways of fasting. Uh, many times it is with food. Sometimes it's social media. Sometimes it's, hey, I'm not going to drink coffee anymore. Good luck with that. I'm just kidding. Uh, it's necessary for many. Uh, but we're going to do this 21 days of fasting together. So he's not saying that fasting is bad. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, he says, when you fast. Meaning there will be a time when you fast. And he talks about how when you fast, you're not going to have this appearance of being sad or being starving. And someone asks you a question, hey, what's going on? How are you doing today? Oh, I'm fasting. Oh, it's so terrible. And that's not the goal of fasting. In fact, that's probably one of those things that you don't even tell people because you're, it's really between you and God. It's a time where you're, you're, you're cutting away or you're allowing the, the spirit to be fed and the flesh to starve in a bit. And you're building your spiritual muscle, if you would. You're building your spiritual strength. You're saying, hey, I'm not going to go and succumb to the temptations of the body when he wants coffee or he wants to eat. You say, I'm going to spend time in the Word of God. I'm going to spend time not doing that and feeding my spirit instead. And so there is definitely a time of fasting. In fact, the Pharisees fasted twice a week. It was Luke chapter 18 that confirmed this, that hey, they fasted twice a week, they give tithes of all they possess. All these righteous things that the Pharisees would do and say that they would do. But in this case, God's not against fasting. He's talking about fasting for the right reason. And he's talking about, hey, my disciples are going to be different because I am with them right now. Much like when you're at a wedding, you're, you're there with the groom. And so Jesus' representation of the groom, the bride being the church, there's a celebration that's happening. These disciples get to be front row seat with Jesus himself. So this is not the time to fast. This is the time to be full of joy. And those you know that Jesus, well, he came to bring joy. If you remember the wedding at Cana, when he came and he turned water into wine, it was this joyous occasion of water, which typically represented judgment. He's come to now give you the, the best wine at the end of the party, but also to show that, hey, I've come to bring joy. And, and it won't always be time when Jesus is physically walking with us, which is the time we're in now. But the joy that comes from him, the joy of the Lord is going to continue to be our strength from those who believe in him that have the Holy Spirit in us. And so we see this celebration. He's talking about this wedding. He's talking about this, this contrast between religion and relationship. And we see that all so often in Christianity. It's not about religion. It's not about following these certain things. Pharisees, you can continue your fasting twice a week. It's not going to necessarily draw you any closer. Then when you physically have Jesus in front of you, yet you're questioning. And yet you're doubting what him and his followers are doing. And so we see that happening just right here in Mark chapter 2. And it's very often for us to say, hey, I'm going to go back to my old ways because that's what I'm comfortable with. And so depending on what religious background you came from, perhaps you say, I'm going to be comfortable with because this is what I need to do. I need to say my, my prayers in this particular way. I need to fast this particular time. I need to do these specific things. But this whole area of scripture Jesus is speaking about, you have to say out with the old and in with the new. You can't be the same person you were before Jesus 
to what you are now. And, and if you've never received Jesus before, you may not know exactly what you're referring to, but those who are in this room, and I'm looking, looking, I know many of you, and you can remember the old life that you lived. And you remember when, when you first gave your life to Christ, I know for myself, there are many things that I had to replace. And, and when Jesus is talking about this, these clothes, he's saying you can't put uh, this cloth, new cloth, on these old clothes. And if, if you think about it back in those days, they had to wash clothes. And the clothes that they would wash, they would particularly shrink. And so if they had a rip or a tear in a garment, they'd have to repair it in some way. And it's interesting, I want to show you a couple, couple things uh, visually. I have some demonstrations of a patch. And so some of you guys know what these are. Like This is like a patch. If you rip your jeans and you get like a new patch, and now you got to you know, patch up your jeans. It, it's funny because years ago, this was actually a thing. Nowadays, you actually buy jeans with holes in them. And so you pay extra for the holes. So I don't know, there's probably a way that you, know, you can make money without patches. But if, you, if I had a rip in my jeans and I tried to put this same patch, a brand new patch, on washed, kind of already constricted clothing, if any of you guys tried to patch up clothes before, it doesn't quite work the same way. Like you'd have to do something different with that patch to put it on there because this patch, not that it matches or not, but if you try to put that on the same hole, well, it's going to be visible. It's not going to stretch the same way. In fact, I've had pants that were repaired. I don't know if you've ever been there. Like at work with like suit pants. And they were patched up and right in front of somebody. I went to bend down to get something. And of course the old tear in the pants happened. The patch ripped open. And I was not very happy about that. But that's a picture of what could happen. That's kind of underrated having me. It's a picture of what happens when you try to put new things into an old life. You see, when I gave my life to Christ... I couldn't hang out with the same exact friends that I hung out with before. Now, it wasn't anything personal against them, but the places they used to hang out with. In fact, I was actually with, uh, in a different relationship. Some of you may or may not know. I was actually engaged with someone prior to Kim. She knows this too, so it's not a secret. But that relationship prior to Jesus was going a different direction. And, I, and when I gave my life to Christ, and, and I went and reported the news, and was so excited that I gave my life to Christ, and I remember on the day that I actually got baptized, we actually got in like a little argument. I don't know if you've ever been there before. Like something really spiritual happens and then all of a sudden you're like fighting with somebody. And it was because she knew that the old person that she knew was not going to be the same person going forward. And I had to leave that life. Eventually God called me to, to walk away, to sacrifice, to leave some of the friends that hung out with, to leave the relationship that I was in. In fact, it was even the job that I was in I ended up leaving. It was, it was this whole new life that was started. And so when Jesus is talking about this patch on these garments, he also used this reference of this new wine that he gives into old wineskins. Now, nowadays, wine is typically in bottles. But back in those days, you can see it on the screen. I actually have a little visual here as well. It's not going to look exactly like this. In fact, this one was made in Spain, not in Israel. But have you guys ever seen one of these before? So this is like a wineskin. You can see the picture on there as well. And so when they would ferment, they would make this wine, the, the bag or the wine skin would actually expand. And so when you see the new versus the old, it, it starts to get stretchy. And if you try to put new wine into an old stretched out wine skin, eventually it's going to burst. It's just not going to work. And so you have to put new wine into a new wine skin. What does that look like in our life? Well, there's got to be some form of change when we decide to make a decision so big that I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to invite the Spirit into my life, yet I'm going to go back to living the same way I was living before. Eventually that life, like the wine skin, is probably going to burst. It's not going to last very long. And so whether it's jeans with holes in them, whether it's this wine skin that Jesus is referencing here, what he's saying is some of us, well, we're a little old and stretched out in our ways. We're trying to follow the ways of our path, and maybe that's through a religious means like the Pharisees. Or maybe it's just the way we tried to live before. And we say, I've accepted Jesus into my life, and now I'm, uh, I want to do something different, but I continue to do the same things. And you can't do the same things that you've done before and try to live out this new life that Jesus gives. Something has to change. And I know for me, there are many things that God took away. And maybe you think about that in your life, like a desire for me of, you know, hey, before, you know, I would go and drink. I know we're talking about wine today, but and, and that kind of thing, but God literally took that desire away from me. I may not look exactly like that for you, but what's that desire 
that says, hey, this every time I go and hang in this place or watch this online or, or, or drink this specific thing, that it just pulls me further and further away. At some point, we need to let that past go. Because the trap of the old follow this religion, try to mix this new life, this new testament, this new covenant that I'm giving you, and still follow the exact same laws, it's not going to go over very well. To try to live the same way that you lived before, now with the Spirit in you, something's going to have to give. Because Jesus, he's in the business of creating new things. If you've ever seen when you buy a seed that now becomes a flower, or if you've ever seen a, a, a caterpillar that all of a sudden is now a butterfly, you can see this old life compared with this new life. And, and it's the same thing I would say with us. Like, some of us know, they've seen the caterpillar of the life that I lived before. And now, I can't compare myself to a butterfly. But if you say, hey, I'm living this new life because I have Jesus in me, it's something that's much greater. I feel like I can fly now. I don't have to just crawl around on the ground and look, you know, just kind of useless type of thing. Now Jesus has made this new creation. That's what we pray for everyone who comes to know Jesus. For everyone who's following this ways, you can't fit Jesus into the old ways and expect us to still live this life that he has for us. Proverbs 26, 11 reminds us that as a dog returns to its own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Kind of a gross visual, but if you guys have dogs, you kind of know what that means. I don't have to describe it too much, but it's basically saying you can't go back to your old ways when you have this new life in you. And it happens with all of us. I mean, if you ever, maybe you, if you're some of you who are married, you're single days, maybe you're single right now, you've been in a relationship that wasn't great, but then you broke up from that relationship and you're just like, well, it wasn't as bad. Now it's worse being alone and it was better in that relationship. I'm just going to go back to that relationship. And then you go back to that relationship and then it's actually worse than it was before. And now you have to leave it again. It's that whole thing. And it's kind of the same thing that the Israelites experienced when they were entering into the promised land. Like they came out of Egypt and they had food there and they had these uh, cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic that they were saying as they walked through the wilderness. I remember those good old days. And, you know, now I'm in the wilderness. Now I don't know where I am. Now I'm single. I left this job that I was getting paid, and now I'm not getting paid. What is next? I should just probably try to go back there. But what God is saying is, hey, hey, this faith of this promised land that is ahead of you. He has this promised land that's ahead of us that they couldn't see while they were walking in the wilderness. They just remembered the things of old that seemed so much better. But in actuality, it would hold them back even further. And so for you, there may be something in your life that perhaps now you're saying, I'm walking in that wilderness. I left this job, I left this relationship, I left this whatever it was, school that your kids were in, and I'm in, I'm in the wilderness. I don't know what the next step is, but God has promised me a land. I have no idea what that looks like, but I'm going to walk in faith towards it. And it's that faith journey that's, well, it's our Christian walk. All of us who gave our life to Jesus can remember the past. And for some, we're thinking, you know what, things weren't so bad back then. But Jesus is promising us, hey, I have something better for you. And if you don't feel like you're in it now, wait till you get to heaven. Because the promise that he gives us is not just for now, it's for this eternity, it's for everlasting life that he gives us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, many of you know it well. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Our future with Jesus will far surpass our past without him. Verse 23. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Here comes that question again. Verse 25, But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Hmm. That's a pretty powerful statement that he's making right there. Lord of the Sabbath. Sabbath was such a <clears throat> big part of the law. It was such an important thing for these Pharisees to follow. And you see now... Someone who's breaking that law. Not only breaking that law, but he's saying, hey, I am Lord of the Sabbath. Well, it's another way where he's saying, I am God. Yes, I can forgive sins. And yes, oh, by the way, you know, Sabbath wasn't 
you know, made for man. It wasn't in the sense of like, hey, you must follow these particular rules. The Sabbath was made so that man can have rest. But Jesus, well, he is our rest. He is our Sabbath. He represents that. And so point number two is Jesus frees us from the trap of the law. We've talked about law before. Law continues to be an issue with these Pharisees. And what we see happening here, we see Jesus with his followers. They're walking through a grain field, a field of wheat. They actually brought some of that as well. If any of you guys are hungry after, we can make some bread with it. But this field here of this wheat, and so these disciples, they would walk through, and they would take this wheat. This is a little dried up, so I don't think you can eat it. But they would take this grain, they would kind of move it around their fingers and pull out these pieces of grain that they can actually eat. And it would be like a snack or a nourishment for them when they were hungry because they were traveling on this way. And so there's nothing necessarily wrong with grabbing the grain from the field. In fact, there are scriptures in Deuteronomy 23. It says, when you come to your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. That's basically saying, hey, if you're walking through and you see this here and you're hungry, you can go ahead and grab it. You're not going to go and intentionally go with a sickle and steal their property. But if you're hungry, you happen to be walking through, you have the right to grab that snack, if you would. And so it wasn't the issue of what was actually happening. The issue was the day. The issue was the law. The issue because it was on the Sabbath day. If it was any other day, it wouldn't really be an issue. But the challenge is the law. It's coming into play again. These Pharisees are asking this question. And you hear the question that they're asking. Wait, why, why do these guys do what's not lawful on the Sabbath? They're not fasting. Now they're not honoring the Sabbath. And Jesus, of course, he answers them with a question. He says, have you not read what David did when he was in need and hungry? And some of them, at this point, were very familiar with what happened with David. And whether, maybe, maybe you are, maybe you're not. It was 1 Samuel of, uh, chapter 21. And David was basically on the run. He goes to the city called Nob. And it was during the priests of Abiathar and Ahimelech who were serving at the same time. And he was hungry. And David, who was king but not quite had his throne yet, he was on the run. He was looking for something to eat. And the priest at the time basically said, hey, we don't have anything here for the common man. All we have is the bread that was set aside for the priests. So in other words, if you were starving one day and you came by this hotel and you popped in here and you were like, I'm starving, I haven't eaten, I don't know where my next meal is going to be, I need some help. And all we had were those little crackers that we give you with the little juice for communion. And you said, hey, this is all we got. See, back in those days, you wouldn't break that law of giving something that was designed for the priest. The showbread was specifically for the priest at the time. It was this holy, consecrated bread. But because of the human need, because these people were hungry... That, that cup, and next week we're going to do communion, the cup and the wafer, that kind of thing, that's designed for remembrance for communion. It's not necessarily for consumption, for eating when you're hungry. But if there was somebody here who was starving and didn't know when their next meal was going to be, you better believe and it would be okay for that person to have that communion wafer or to drink that, that grape juice that we give. Why? Because human need is more important than following the law, than obedience to the law. There were 613 laws back then that these Pharisees were set to follow. It wasn't just the Ten Commandments. It's an important, uh, another habit of grace that we talked about not too long ago. But this particular period, we talk about the Sabbath, there are certain things when it says, hey, 39 laws that you can't specifically do on the Sabbath. Like you can't start a car, because that's almost like starting a fire or ignition. So you can't drive anywhere, so that's why you see many of them walking to their synagogue. There were violations of the Sabbath that say, if you reap, Thresh, winnow, or prepare food in some way, you are now in violation of one of the Sabbath rules. And so when these guys are now walking through this grain field, which again, Deuteronomy said it was okay to do that, now they're grabbing a piece of wheat, they're now making food with it basically, they're, they're threshing, they're reaping, they're winnowing this particular wheat, now all of a sudden they're in violation. And sure enough, as a Pharisee, they're to call them out on it. And Jesus is basically saying that important principle. Human need is more important than religious ritual. Any way you slice it, human need is going to be more important. When you go after looking for a way to meet a need versus following a specific law, the, the human need is going to be more important. He cares more about that than this fire, uh, following this law. It was Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 says, God speaking, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. These 
Sacrifices are important, but loving others, it's more important. It's more important than religion. If you have to follow a specific sac uh, sacrifice, or if you have to follow a specific religious principle at the cost of someone else, like stepping over someone else because I have to follow this. For example, a, a scenario that came up a couple weeks ago. I don't know if Ryan's in your it. We have a, a family, Ryan and Colleen, a great couple of ours. Ryan leads and our, our men's ministry. They were on their way here to church, and they needed to be here by a certain time. And on their way to church, in fact, some of you may have been there, there was a, there was a little accident that happened. A bike accident that happened. And I remember they, they were driving, and Ryan told the story, and he said, he was like, I gotta get to church, I'm late, I'm running late, I got the kids, I'm getting there. And they see this accident, and all of a sudden, his wife tells him, hey, we gotta pull over and see if everything's okay. And sure enough, they get out, and they run, and they pray over this person, this bike accident. And then they jump back in, they get there, and, they, and he comes and tells the story, they come in a little bit late, and so I'm hammering him because he's late. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> No, but I'm like, hey, you know, you're coming late, everything okay? And they're telling us this story, and we're like, man, if that's not like being a spiritual first responder, like, even before I think the medics got there, we had somebody with a get in the story shirt on praying over this person. And when you think about it, yeah, it's important to get to church. Like, religiously, in your mind, you're thinking, I gotta get to church, gotta get there on time, I can't let anything get my way. But when you see a human need, you see an opportunity to potentially pray for somebody, you can be late any day for church, if you're going and you're going to be praying or helping someone else. Human need is going to be more important than following these religious laws. And so it's important to know when you see Jesus saying, hey, I am your rest. You don't have to worry about following these specific laws. The Sabbath is put in place for you to rest, but he is going to be our, our ultimate rest. It's not about following these specific laws. The laws are for us. We're not made for the laws. That's what Jesus is saying here. We serve this merciful, this loving God who cares about his people over following laws and routine. Over to chapter 3. And Mark 3, verse 1. The questions continue, but the tables turn a little bit. It says, verse 1, And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? I love seeing this now. It's now Jesus who's asking the questions. But it's interesting to see, they kept silent. Jesus always answers these questions with a question. When Jesus is the one asking questions, they kept silent. That's their response. In verse 5, And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Isn't this an interesting area of scripture right here? You see, Jesus put into a situation where He's back in the synagogue, he's teaching. If you remember, uh, a few weeks back, we saw Jesus teaching with this authority. All of a sudden, this demonic man stands up in front of him. So there's always opposition in, in the sanctuary, if you would. But now Jesus is back there, there's this man who's come. He has this withered hand. Now, in those days, this withered, the word for withered typically wasn't something he was born with. This was probably a man who maybe had a stroke or something happened to his hand that he was now paralyzed or was now withered. And the fact that he's even in the synagogue, he probably had to, like, hide his hand. Because if they saw this withered hand, he'd be considered unclean and not allowed into the sanctuary or into the synagogue. So the fact that he is there is probably something he's trying to stay away from everybody and not show the fact that his hand is withered. In those days as well, you know, your hands are so important because it's how men basically got their work and got their livelihood. And so someone who wasn't able to use... Uh, their full use of their hands, perhaps it was a carpenter or somebody who used their hands, this was something that potentially, maybe he hasn't eaten in a while, maybe he hasn't been able to care for his family, there's something broken in this man's life. Yet he's here to hear this teaching from Jesus. And so what happens when Jesus calls this man forward? Well, he's asking this question to the Pharisees. He's asking, what, what's better to do? Is a Sabbath again? That's the challenge on the table. We already heard what you had to say about the wheat fields. Now we're in a potential position where we're going to heal somebody. We're going to do something good. We're working in a sense, because essentially one of these violations would be to work in any way, which would include healing. 
unless it was to attempt to save someone's life immediately. And so Jesus asked this question, is it okay to heal somebody on the Sabbath? Is it okay to violate the law to do something good for someone on the Sabbath? He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? I don't know about you, but even though me not being Jesus, if I ask you that question, I think it's a pretty quick response. I think if someone said, hey, is, is it better to do good or evil? Is it better to you know, kill or, or, or to save life? That's a pretty easy response to say, well, it's obviously better to do good, it's obviously better to save life, than it is to kill, but these guys remain silent. They don't know what to say because they're trying to set the wily coyote trap to try to catch the roadrunner, and it's just not working because they've already been fooled before. Okay, I got it. I hear what you're saying, Jesus. You ask the question, you ask the question. Now this question where they're trying to trap him, they don't want to sit there and say, oh, it's better to kill. Oh, it's better to do evil. And so they remain silent, but the challenge of just remaining silent. Jesus in this situation could have easily done nothing. And the challenge in our life very often when we see something happen, maybe it's a situation like Ryan and Colleen when they drive before and they see this accident, to easily just drive by and do nothing. We're put in a situation where this word apathy comes in. And point number three is Jesus frees us from this trap of apathy. Apathy being, hey, I just don't care anymore enough. I've lost this feeling of caring and I've lost this feeling to then react. And you may have heard this quote. It's a pretty popular one by Edmund Burke. It says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And so in this sense, yes, the men remain silent. But it's Jesus who then has his chance to then, hey, should I be proving to these men that I can heal or should I just let it go? It's a Sabbath day. Maybe I should be honoring and show the men that we should honor the Sabbath. But that's not what Jesus does. He didn't come here just to follow uh, exactly what these guys say. What he came to do is fulfill the law. He didn't come to say the law is not important, but he came to fulfill every piece of the law. And so this challenge on the Sabbath, this good man who's triumphing evil, well, he does something. And for us, when we see a need, our challenge is, well, how many times do we see this need and we actually do something? Because I become very apathetic, I'll be honest with you, sometimes when I see maybe a homeless person on the street or walking up to your car with a sign, you know, like, oh, these guys, again, let me look the other way or let me act like I'm on the phone. None of you guys would do that, right? <laughs> maybe you see the commercials of the pets and they're like, hey, donate this much money to help the pets and they have the sad animals on the commercial and you're just like, I've seen so many of these things, I'm just not going to react. But there's a time where we need to care and where we need to act. Especially those who call ourselves Christians, there are seasons in our lives and situations in our lives that are put there specifically to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so if we don't react, well, who are we expecting to? And so these guys, they're seeing. The interesting thing is they know that Jesus can heal this man by the question he's asking. But they still want to challenge him in it. And, and I read this quote from David Guzik, and I thought it was very fitting here. He said, these, they knew what Jesus could do, yet their knowledge didn't draw them to Jesus. How is that possible? He says, it was as if a man could fly, but the authorities want to know if he had a pilot's license. <laughs> like, can you imagine if, like, you know, Superman was here and you saw that he flew and you're like, that's so awesome that he can fly, but does that guy have a license? He knew he can't fly this amount of speed and he can't fly a drone over a park nowadays and he's breaking this law. They're more concerned with the law than they are with the miracle of a man flying, with the miracle of a man that can heal. This man who's fully God and fully man, it's amazing to see that every time there's good, every time there's this authoritative teaching, there's evil standing right nearby. It happened when he was teaching. It's happening right here. And so even in this sense, we can see that Jesus, he's still Lord and he's our Savior. And he's still more powerful than any questions that it is to ask. So he asked this question. And then if you look at his response, it says he became angry. When they were silent, when they couldn't respond to him. A simple question. Is it better to do good or evil? Is it better to kill or save life? They couldn't even respond. And that, this is not a mistake that was written here. Jesus actually had emotions. Because he was fully God, fully man. Who was Jesus? He was fully God. He was fully man. He had emotions. He became angry. You may remember John chapter 2 when Jesus was angry when they were turning uh, the temple at the time into this place of selling stuff. And selling uh, the animals that were sacrificed normally. And now they're trying to make a profit in the temple. And Jesus saw what was becoming of this place, and he, he made this, this, this whip, and he started turning over tables. 
He experienced this righteous anger. And for us in this room, how many of us experience anger? All right, now you're sinning because you're lying. But anyways, any of them, we experience anger. I know I do. But it's a difference between just angry because of a certain situation or this righteous anger. Jesus was angry because what was supposed to be done right, use the temple that's, that's dedicated or teach, dedicated for the worship of God. When he answered this question, evil, good, very simple one, they're not answering. He's becoming angry because the right thing to do was to be answering with the right way. And so he has this righteous anger because of the hardness of their hearts. They become so cold and so hard they can't even answer a simple question about good and evil. And so, how does he respond? Well, of course, he takes the position of healing this man. This man with his withered hand that he calls in front of everybody. Perhaps he was a little embarrassed. Perhaps he was trying to hide something. Jesus then asks him a simple question. Which sounds simple, but in a sense was very difficult. Much like if you remember when he says, hey, uh, pick up your mat and walk. He's now telling him, stretch out your hand. And he's probably thinking, my hand is withered. They're going to see it. I can't even move my hand. But Jesus, he asks him to do this. This man now responds with obedience. And all of a sudden his hand is healed. His miraculous power is proven once again. Against what the Pharisees think. It's amazing to see that what we bring forward in obedience. You know, if you can remember the day that you walked forward and gave your life to Christ when you heard this call, perhaps some of you, if you're watching online, maybe you haven't made that decision yet, but it's this call. When you see God working and you hear His voice calling, there is a step for us to take. This man could have easily said, no, no, I, I, I can't reach out my hand. I'm good. I'm going to sit down and back away. But he takes a step, much like the man who picked up his mat and walked, not knowing that he could do it or not. He reaches out, he stretches out his hand, and it's fully restored. It's amazing to see what faith can do when we're obedient to God. And so in our sense as well, there's something that he's calling you to do. There's something where he's saying, stretch out your hand and take this position. Or stretch out your hand and move your kids somewhere else. Stretch out your hand and maybe move to another state, whatever that may look like. There is a step of faith and obedience that we must take, much like the Israelites leaving Egypt, that we won't see the other side until we're actually there in the promised land. But it's that journey of faith, of trusting, and of following and of obedience that, yes, in this case, it was miraculously instantly healed, his withered hand. But there's something withered in our life, maybe it's in our soul, that Jesus can heal when we take that step of faith and obedience. If you ever go to New York and you See these subway signs. They have a sign that's up there. It says, if you see something, say something. And I kind of put it in the context of, if you see a need, if you feel or you hear a command from Jesus, you need to do something. You need to say something. We need to respond. We can't get caught up in this trap of apathy of just doing nothing, of not responding because of these ways of the laws. Jesus, he didn't fear breaking the law to heal a man. He didn't get trapped in the trap of apathy. He saw the need, and he did something. And so as hard as these Jews, these Pharisees, they tried to trap Jesus, he could not get caught in the trap. We serve a God who can't be trapped. And even today, you know that people try to trap those who are followers of Christ, and perhaps that's you. Maybe somebody has asked you, hey, uh, can you smoke a cigar? Or hey, can you have a drink or whatever? Oh, you're a Christian, right? What does that say? And you feel like, man, how do I respond to that? I don't see the cigar chapter here. You know, what do I... And, and so there's ways of like, you know, maybe it's like the, the question of can I get a tattoo or not? And, and, you know, some of these are not clearly answered in Scripture. And for some it may be okay, and for some it may not be. Depending on if you're disobeying, let's say, a parent. Uh, or perhaps if you feel good about that, God will give you in your conscience the answer to that question. But some may still try to trap you. And so Jesus is the one who frees us from the traps of this world. When we spend time in His Word, when we spend time with other believers... And we get to know him deeper. Whatever it is that we're struggling with. That we felt like is, we're caught up in this trap. He's the one who frees us from that. And so if you're caught up in this trap of the past. And you're thinking hey. I don't know if I can ever be forgiven. For what I've done. I'm still this kind of old wineskin that I'm, leaving, that I'm living in. Or how can God use me after the life that I've lived. He can free you from that. Maybe you're trapped and you're struggling with the law and you're saying, hey, I must do this and this and this and that. I must fast at certain times or else I'm not obedient to him. Or maybe I lose my salvation. 
He can free you from that trap as well. If you're struggling with this, this trap of apathy, when you're saying, hey, I don't know what decision to make, I'm just going to do nothing. I'm just going to back away. I'm just going to live in fear and, and not follow the step of obedience that he's calling me to do. He can free you from that as well. For all of us, we want to experience this, this miraculous love of this God who cannot be trapped. And when we give our lives to him, we, we have his spirit on the inside of us, and he can guide us, he can lead us, and he can free us from whatever trap that we're experiencing. He, he wants all of us to know him, to be saved, and to experience his love. And so he gives us this opportunity to not get trapped up by the enemy, because he'd like nothing more than to trap us, but to be free, free from that escape room, free from the wily e. coyote, and to live this life. And he says, hey, he allows us to catch him if we can. And all we have to do is stretch out our hand in obedience. Amen? Amen. Father, we come to you today and we're reminded of the fact that you are, yes, the God who asks questions, yes, the God who can't be trapped, but you are the God who saves us, the God who came down, fully God, fully man. You lived a sinless life for us. And even as we read these examples in your word and we see how you show us when those who try to oppose you, who try to trap you in these questions, for those who don't even know, they're so clouded with what's right and what's wrong and what's not, you bring us clarity. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for making it clear to us the direction that we need to take. Thank you for freeing us from our past that we don't have to live this old life that we've lived. And we just want to lift up everyone here today who's maybe living in a way where they feel like I'm still stuck in my past while I'm trying to move forward. For those who feel like I get so caught up in trying to follow rules and regulations that I don't have any joy in my life. For those who just say, hey, I'm better off just not making a decision, not knowing that, well, they're still making a decision. Will it be the right one? For those whose hearts have grown hard when there's time of need, Father, we pray today that you can soften our heart, that you can give us a new wine scene to put this new wine that you can give us in, that we won't get caught up into the old ways of the law, that we can trust you and know that you have something greater on the other side. And for all of us that are struggling and lost in the wilderness, help us to see your promised land. Even if it's just a glimpse right now, help us to, to know you. We know you provide your word. So we can go and, and as we read your word, we, we have promises that you send us and as we're walking along this path that may seem dark at times, it may seem like we have no food or nothing to drink, but then you, right at the right moment, you provide us a way, you provide us hope and faith. Help us to be people of that hope and that faith. We ask that you can guide us and direct us. We thank you for your words. In Jesus' name we pray. And before I say amen, I just want to give us an opportunity to act in a step of obedience. I want to give us an opportunity for those of us in this room, for those of you who are watching online. If you've never gave your life to Christ before and this all seems a little foreign to you, well, this is an opportunity for you to take a step of faith, much like this man with the withered hand, to stretch out your hand. And not just for those who don't know Jesus, but if you're here in this room and you say, you know what? I feel like I'm caught in the trap of the past. I, I keep going back to my old ways. I'm better off being isolated and alone because if someone knew me just a little bit and some of the things that I watch on the internet or the places that I hang out in, they would never see me as this Christian and, and I don't want them to see me that way. I want to just, hey, I'm okay, I'm blessed, I'm good. I don't, I don't want people to see me in that way and not know the reality behind it. If you're struggling with something in your life that you feel trapped in, if you have a decision that you need to make, if you need to just call out on him in obedience, we're just going to play a part of a song. And while we do that, I want everyone to be in prayer. And if you would just close your eyes and have your head just bow. This is, it's not really an opportunity for any type of attention other than the attention of Jesus, for him to see our obedience. And so if you've never given your life to Christ, where you are in your seat, I want you to be like this man with the withered hand. Just stretch out your hand, raise your hand right where you are. And if you say, today I want to... I want to say, hey, I know I can't be perfect, but only through your blood I can be perfect. The relationship, the imperfect person I am through Jesus, I can have a relationship with a God who is perfect. Raise your hand right where you are if you say, hey, I want to be forgiven of my sins. And if you're sitting here today as we play this song for just a few moments, 
If this is a chance for you to raise your hand and say, I want to be free from the traps of my past. I want to be free from anything, any law that's constricting me. I want to be free from just taking moments to do nothing. I want to be able to do something. Just raise your hand where you are. We'll play a quick song, give you an opportunity to pray, to raise your hands. We'd love to see uh, many hands raised here, whether you don't know Jesus and this is your first chance to take that step, or you're in a position where you need to act in obedience. A simple act of raising your hand. We have our heads bowed, we have our eyes closed. It's not for anybody else. It's really just a moment for you to take out your hand and stretch it out before him while we play this song. Let's be in prayer. Thank you all. Good to look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.